Hello and welcome everyone to Varsity Tutors Virtual Summer Camp, where all summer long we've had instructors dropping some pretty incredible intelligence. But since the name of the game these days is artificial intelligence, we brought our friends from Data Robot in to teach us all about artificial intelligence, how AI works, and most importantly, how you can use it to better the world in the future. So this is lesson one of two. Come back at the same time on Friday for even more once we've uh, you know, we've kind of um, stoked your appetite today. Now, a couple things before we get started. Um, they want to know a little bit about your intelligence, about artificial intelligence. So um, our team of presenters here will be asking you some questions. Use the interaction panel to the right of the video to answer their questions so we can get a little bit of a feel for, for what you know and what you want to know. Also at the end, we're going to have a Q&A session with our panel of experts. And so throughout class, ask questions if you have them, put your name on them so we know who's asking, and, and then we'll get to all those at the end so we can, uh, can tap their intelligence to answer all of your artificial intelligence questions. Make sure also that, uh, that you've got a camera nearby because we'll have an opportunity at the end to take a selfie with the experts. Um, we'll also put up at the end of class um, some information on how you can get your own data robot trial account to start using data and, and solving the world's problems from your keyboard. So without further ado, I want to introduce the team from data robot here. You guys are going on camera. So um, smile and wave. Uh, we've got Sarah's going to be up first then Natalie, and then Rosalia for a great presentation today. So everyone, welcome to Varsity Tutors, and let's get to it. Hi, everybody. Uh, today, welcome to Summer Camp with Data Robot. We're going to be leading session one today, and as Brian said, session two is on Friday. So the, the summer camp is called, What is Artificial Intelligence? Um, and so first, let's introduce who we are. Uh, my name is Sarah. I'm a data scientist at Data Robot, and I studied physics at Dartmouth. I'm joined here by Natalie, who is also a data scientist here at Data Robot and went to Carnegie Mellon, and Rosalia, another data scientist with her PhD from the University of Washington. So today we're gonna start off with a brief history of AI, and then we're gonna answer a core question, what is machine learning? Natalie is gonna go over two classic problems of machine learning called regression and classification, and Rosalia is going to lead a demo. We're going to close out today with a question and answer session, and then you'll be able to get selfies. So first off, let's do a brief history of AI. If we wanted to do a full history of AI, we could spend an entire college course digging into the specifics and nuances. So for today's session, we're going to cover some key milestones and breakthroughs, a few of the underlying themes, and some examples of modern AI. So, how far back do we have to go to see the earliest connections to AI? If we take our time machine back to the 1700s, we'll find Jonathan Swift writing about Gulliver's Travels. There are other examples going back to 1300 we could have argued for, but Gulliver's Travelers, Travels is considered the earliest known reference to a device in any way resembling a modern computer. So that device is made out of wood, linked together by wires, and uses little language tiles that you can see visualized here. Swift called it the engine, and its operators would turn all the handles around the edge to make it speak and output and answer questions. So Swift's engine is in some ways not that far from the AI we utilize now. Specifically, its purpose was to quote unquote, improve our speculative knowledge by operations and outputs. So now we skip ahead almost 200 years to meet Alan Turing, who's known as the father of artificial intelligence and theoretical computer science. The device next to him is not Jonathan Swift's engine, of course, but it does resemble it a little, I kind of think. It's called the bomb and was developed by the Polish and British cryptologists of the Second World War to decipher Germany's Enigma code. These Axis armies would often encrypt their messages and it was an incredibly difficult code to break and required the invention of this enormous machine. His device is widely considered one of the first modern examples of a computer and also demonstrates a pervasive theme of how humans have utilized machines to augment our own capabilities. Now, going ahead with Alan Turing, he's also famous for coming up what's no, with what's known as the Turing test. He wanted to know if technology, specifically AI, becomes sufficiently advanced, how do we distinguish it from human intelligence? Can you teach a robot to feel, to think the same way humans do? So if the simple question is, can machines think? 
he found a specific way to pose that question. So an interrogator sits in a room separate from two players, A and B, and can only interact with them with human questions, with written questions. One of those players is a computer and one is a human. Can the interrogator correctly figure out who is who? Can the computer imitate a human successfully? These are actually slightly different questions and goals and raise a bigger one about the purpose of AI. Is our goal to imitate human intelligence, to exceed it, or to do something entirely different? Now, moving on from Turing, it wasn't until 1955 that a term for this idea of a human-like computer was coined. If we wanted to match human intelligence via machines, then using the word intelligence made sense, but it's not organic or natural. So that's how we landed on artificial. Thus, AI is how we typically describe the advancements in computers and technology that bring it closer to replicating human intelligence. Now, ever since he created it, people have been obsessed with the Turing test. You know, there are sci-fi movies out there about it too. There have been several attempts to satisfy it, starting back in the 80s. In 1988, the Jabberwocky chatbot was developed by Rollo Carpenter to see if it could pass the Turing test. You know, it's still online, so you can actually look it up and play with it and decide for yourself. But between you and me, it's pretty obvious that we had a far way to go. And even now with modern chat bots, you probably think the same. Now, when working with AI, it's important to understand how AI functions. It is a tool. In a simple sense, you are giving the computer a goal or objective to complete. These goals often either end up being very narrow or very broad. A fairly broad goal, for example, is to create a machine that would talk convincingly like a human, like the Turing test would require. An even broader one is called artificial general intelligence. That's an AI that can learn anything we can. Of course, these are big challenges that are still open and being actively researched. But when you go the opposite direction and make these goals incredibly narrow, you get events like what happened here in 1997. By the late 90s and into the present, that's another very specific theme we can trace. We can trace. AI can be trained to do one thing really well. So well, they're better than us at our best. Chess is a great example of a narrow goal. The goal is for the computer to capture the opponent's king. For as complex a game as chess is, there are a finite number of moves, and each piece has very clear rules to follow. In 1997, IBM's Deep Blue beat world champion chess grandmaster Gary Kasparov. It evaluated over 200 million positions per second. That's something we could never do. So while chess is a great example of narrow AI, and I think a lot of people have played at least one game of chess uh, against a computer in their lifetime, when we skip ahead now about 14 years, we can see advanced AI tackling slightly broader applications with still narrower objectives. In this case, we're talking about IBM's Watson, which used natural language capabilities. That's the ability to process and understand language, in this case, Jeopardy questions, um, to play and win at Jeopardy against two of the most successful players, Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter. In the case of Jeopardy, this demonstrated a significant increase in AI's ability since it both had to understand the questions form and then also reply accurately in order to achieve its objective of winning the game. Now, by this point, right now where we are in history, advancements in AI and computers have been accelerating at a blistering pace. In 2016, an AI program known as AlphaGo beat Lee Sadel at the ancient abstract strategy game of Go. The next year, its newer version beat the world champion Go player. For context, Go is largely considered one of the most complex games in the world, with more possible moves than there exist atoms in our universe. Every single turn has more than 250 possible moves. So now we're up to the present. I think it's safe to say in our scheme of history, we can see that there have been incredible breakthroughs and highlights from AI, and also observed the key underlying themes of how we've remained focused on making AI, AI imitate or improve on ourselves as best as we can in ways both narrow and broad. I'd like to do a quick knowledge check. You got, let's say 30 seconds to think on this question. Do you remember when the, coin, the name AI was first coined? Take a minute to answer the letter of your answers in the chat box. Okay, seeing some answers start to come in here. 
1700s was a little bit of a red herring. Those of you that are guessing 1950s are getting it right. It was 1955. So where are we now? What does AI in our everyday lives look like? Believe it or not, and you're probably already aware of this, we are surrounded every day by potentially hundreds of very narrow applications of AI. Some are small. The algorithms that drive what ads you see on your social media feeds or recommend shows and movies on Netflix for you to watch. Others are gonna have quite a large impact, like the facial recognition technology you experience maybe at airports or to unlock your phone. While things still have a ways to come, even broader and bigger versions of AI in our modern lives soon to come are self-driving cars, medical diagnoses improved by AI, and even art. So what does this mean for the AI of the future? If we reflect on our brief history lesson here, it'll require a significant amount of imagination to create these technologies of tomorrow. Every breakthrough we've experienced had to first be imagined by someone in their heads, like Jonathan Swift thought about uh, the engine in Gulliver's Travels. There's a lot about AI that we could never have anticipated. We knew to expect facial recognition, but we didn't imagine deep fakes. And tomorrow, team two is gonna talk more about this and the ethics around AI. To this point, while there's a lot we can imagine and plan for in the future, inevitably there's gonna be many surprises along the way. Our ability to create the next version of AI gets better the more we understand about the technology we have now and also the more we understand about ourselves. We're still learning incredible amounts about how the human brain works. And that often ends up feeding back into understanding how AI is trained and built. And AI can even help us understand more about how our brains work as well. So for the rest of class today, we're gonna focus on the AI of the present, what it is and how it works. I hope you all have been inspired to think a bit about what the AI of the future looks like and if you might wanna have a hand in helping to create it. All right, Natalie's uh, taking over. Thanks so much, Sarah, for that introduction. Uh, my name is Natalie Buckland, and as Sarah mentioned, I am a data scientist at Data Robot. I'm going to be walking you through uh, how we actually do machine learning. But before we get into that, um, let's have a quick question. So Sarah mentioned what the uh, brain of modern AI was. So let's see if you guys remember what that was. So we have deep learning, uh, machine learning, computer networks, neural networks, and E, all of the above. So let's wait a bit for those answers to come in. I see a lot of answers coming in for computer learning. That seems like a, a very obvious choice. I see a lot for E, all the above. Um, all of those terms do look like uh, uh, they could be the answer to this question. Um, but the actual answer to this question is uh, B, it's machine learning. Machine learning is the modern brain of uh, artificial intelligence. So let's get into how we actually do machine learning. And we're gonna watch two quick videos that will give you a good primer on how this works. So let me just play this first video. This is, uh, what is machine learning? Hi, I'm Alex Shoup, software engineer working at Data Robot, and today I'm going to talk about machine learning. You may have heard the terms AI and machine learning recently. They're sometimes used together, separately, and even interchangeably. I'm going to clarify some misconceptions and then walk through a real-world machine learning example. First, it's important to understand that machine learning is a subset of AI. AI is the general term, while machine learning and deep learning fall under the umbrella of AI. To put it simply, a machine learning algorithm, aka a model, uses historical data to uncover insights, determine relationships, and make predictions about future trends. Basically, a machine learning model learns from examples. So let's walk through an example case. Okay, great. So in that video, we learned that a machine learning model requires historical data to make predictions about future data. And in this next video, we're going to learn about two very common machine learning problem types. Hi, I'm Jake. I work on special projects here at DataRobot. 
Today I'm going to talk to you about common machine learning problem types that you're likely to encounter when you're building out AI systems at your company. The four I'm going to talk about today are classification, both binary and multi-class, regression, which is a continuous variable or oftentimes a numerical outcome, time series, where we want to forecast out over a specified time window, and anomaly detection, where we're looking for outliers in our data. For binary classification, it's a subset to classification. With binary classification, there are only two possible classes. This could be yes, no, true, false. A bank will use binary classification when it's doing its loan underwriting. There are only two possible classes or outcomes that the loan could have. Either yes, it will default, or no, it won't default. A bank is keen to understand the default rates on a loan in order to avoid underwriting bad loans. Multi-classification is also a subset to classification problems, but unlike binary classification, it has more than two possible outcomes. This could be yes, no, maybe. It could be red, yellow, or blue. And it could even be A, B, C, or D. Next up is regression. With regression, again, we're predicting a continuous variable, which is often a numerical value. For a hospital, they would use regression to predict how long a patient is going to remain at their hospital once admitted. If it's going to be one day, that's significantly different than the patient being there for 14 days or even 30 days. Okay, so in that video, we learned that there are two commonly used machine learning problem types, uh, classification and regression. So let me just reshare my screen. And what we're gonna be doing today is we're gonna be diving into uh, those two very commonly used examples. Um, but we also heard uh, a, a couple examples of um, what machine learning is in those prior videos. So we have another question, uh, and this question is, which of the following is not an example of machine learning? Uh, again, this is, uh, which of these is not an example of machine learning? So is it chatbots? Is it Google Translate, uh, a weather app, um, such as when it tells you the probability that it's going to rain? a light proximity sensor, or Facebook suggested friends. Um, you know that sometimes if you use Facebook, when you log in, it will recommend people that, that could be your friends. So which one of these is not an example of machine learning? So let's wait a little bit for that answer to come in. I see a lot of folks are saying, uh, let's see, Google Translate. Um, I see some for chatbots. Um, but the correct answer is actually light proximity sensors. Light proximity sensors are not an example of machine learning. Um, that is uh, just a basic sensor that will detect if something is closer, is closer or not to the sensor, uh, and it does not rely on machine learning. Okay, so let's dive into uh, the two examples of machine learning. So remember, we're gonna cover classification and regression, and let's start with regression. So regression is predicting a continuous number. So in this example, we have a plot of square footage of a house against the sales price. So the further to the right we go on this graph, that means the square footage of a house is increasing. And the further to the top of this graph we go, that means the sales price of a house is increasing. So if we have a, a point right here in the top right quadrant, as we do with this home in Texas, this is a home that has a very high square footage uh, and a very high sales price. And every example on this graph is an example that the machine is going to learn from. And what we wanna do is create a model that will make predictions from this data. So this red line represents our model. And as we travel uh, along this model and we increase or decrease the square footage, we can see that the model will predict a change in the sales price. So for example, right now, we're looking at a square footage of 1,500 square feet, and the model is predicting that the home will be $200,000. But what happens when we increase the square footage? So you might have noticed that we just increased it from 1,500 square feet to 1,750 square feet, and the model predicted that the sales price will increase we went from $200,000 to $225,000. And for any point along this line where we give the model a sales 
a, a square footage, it will give us a sales price. So that is an example of how the model learns. So an actual example of this algorithm is called linear regression. And we're going to walk through how we can use linear regression to predict a number. So let's look at that line again. How do we come up with this line? So what we do is we want to find the line that fits our data best. So what does that mean? So let's say we, we plot an arbitrary line. We're going to calculate the difference of every single point from the line. So for example, this point is $15,000 above the line. This point is $15,000 below the line. And for every single point, we're going to calculate what that difference is from the line and sum it up. And that sum is called the total error. So in this example, this line has a total error of $300,000. So let's try a different line. So now we have a new line that is this gray line. Then we have a new measurement of difference from the line. This point has now become $3,000 above the line. And this point has become $20,000 below the line. Let's try one more line. So now we have a new line and we have another measure of difference from the line. In this example, the total error is $380,000. And what we're trying to do is find the line that has the smallest total error. And the model will try many different lines. So we wanna try the more lines, the better. In this example, this orange line was the first line we tried and it had a total error of $300,000. That was the smallest total error. So that means this is the line that fits our data the best. So that's an example of how we can use linear regression to predict a continuous number. But what about when we want to do classification? So if you remember from the video, we have regression and we have classification as the other type of machine learning problem. So in this example, we're trying to predict a category. So looking at this chart, we're trying to predict if something is a circle or an X. And we have this boundary called the decision boundary. And we can see that everything to the right of this boundary is an X and everything to the left is an O. So let's look at a more uh, in-depth example. So we have this line here and we have points that are green to the right and we have points that are red to the left. When a new point appears on our line, so when we have a point over here to the left, we know that this is supposed to be a red point. And we have a point that appears over here, a new point that appears over here to the right we know that this point is supposed to be green. So can we come up with a better boundary between these red and green points? So we can see that we have this divider line in the middle, but we can see that there might be a more natural boundary between these red and green points. The more natural boundary might be somewhere over here to the left of the line. So the example that we're going to walk through today is called a support vector machine. So that has a really cool name. It sounds a little bit scary, but it's, it's pretty easy. Um, so let's look at our red and green points again. So in order to come up with that better boundary, we're going to use the points at the end of the groups. So what does that mean? So we're gonna use this green point here because it's at the end of the green points. And we're going to use this red point here because it's at the end of the red points. And we can see that if we want to draw the middle between this green point and this red point, we have this new boundary that's here in the yellow. And we can see that it's a little bit different from the boundary, uh, the white boundary that we originally had. Uh, but we can see this yellow boundary is more equidistant in between these red and green points. And we can now say, well, everything that's to the right of this yellow boundary is supposed to be green and everything that's to the left of this boundary is supposed to be red. And we can see that it could be to the right of this uh, yellow line, uh, but it would still be to the left of this white line. Uh, so that means the yellow line is a better boundary in between these two points. Okay, so that was a really easy example, but what about something like this? So in this example, we have green points in the middle and we have red points on either side. So we can't draw a boundary that will separate this example. So what do we do? How can we solve this example? Well, 
we can still use a support vector machine and the support vector machine has a really cool property. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to go from one dimension into two dimensions. So in this example, this data is on one dimension. It only has an X axis. If we want to go into two dimensions, we would add a Y axis. So let's see what that looks like. So we have the same exact example before. We have green points with red points on either side, but we've transformed it into two dimensions. And you might be able to see that we have a more clear example between the green points and the red points. I can see that in this two dimensional space, the green points are a little bit higher than the red points. And you might imagine I could draw a line separating these two points if I wanted to. So how did we go from one dimension into two dimension? So what we're gonna do is we're going to take every point on the X axis and we're going to square it and draw it on the Y axis. So let me show you what that means. So we have this point here and let's pretend that it's a three. So if we square it, three times three is nine. So we have a three on the X axis and we're going to plot a nine on the Y axis. And that becomes this point here. What about this example? So we have a seven on the X axis. And if we square it, seven times seven is 49. And we'll plot that point here. Let's do one more. So we have this point, this is 22 and we'll square it. And that gives us 484. So we'll plot 484 on the Y axis. So in that way, we've gone from one dimension into two dimensions. Wow, pretty cool. Uh, and our data looks a lot different now. And what we can now do is draw a new line that separates our red and our green points. So we can say, when we have a new point that's above this green line, or the, excuse me, above this yellow line, we know that it's supposed to be green because it is above the separator. When we have a point that's below this yellow line, we know that it's supposed to be red because all the red points are below the separator. So this was an example in two dimensions, but let's take a look at the example in three dimensions. So over here on the right, we see a three dimensional plot of some data. We have some X's, some black X's down here, and we have some red circles up here. And as this plot is rotated, we can see it's in three dimensions. And let's watch as it rotates. You can already tell there might be a good way to separate the red points and the axis down here in this three dimensional space. And as it rotates, we'll see that it's going to draw a new plane that will separate this. There's the plane right there that separates these points in a three dimensional space. And that plane is called the hyperplane, very cool name. And in fact, what we're looking at here with this yellow line, this is the hyperplane in a two dimensional space. Okay, so that was an example of how we can do machine learning. So let's go through the types of AI applications that you guys are most excited for. So we have auto generative AI. So that is when you're texting on your phone and it's recommending words to complete the text. We have audio AI. We have geospatial AI, uh, which is using geological features in a model. We have visual AI, which is things like um, computer vision. And we have robotics and AI, which could be an example of a self-driving car. How does a car navigate a 3D space? So let's wait a minute for you guys to come uh, submit your answers. There is no wrong answer here. We're just looking to see what types of applications that you guys are most excited for. So I see a lot of examples for auto-generative AI. So it's very cool um, to complete a sentence when you're texting. I see a lot of examples for robotics. So that would be uh, self-driving cars. But the example I'm seeing the most is visual AI. And that is really cool uh, because we're actually going to have a visual AI demo for you guys today. And for that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Rosalia, who will be walking you through an example of how we can use machine learning and images together. Perfect. Um, thank you, Natalie. 
Um, so for today's um, demo, I am going to show you how you can do classification using data robot. And the problem that we're going to, to do today or with the models that we're going to do today are models that are going to be used to build to distinguish between two characters from the Star Wars movie, so BB-8 and R2-D2. So let's get started. So within Data Robot, this is the interface that you will see. And one way you can enter your data is through this local file. You go and grab your data and you upload it into Data Robot. So now Data Robot is reading your data and um, and basically let, providing it in an interface where you can preview it. Now, while that's happening, let's talk a little bit about the data that you are going to be, um, that we're going to be using to build the model. So look at these images. Essentially, we're giving um, Data Robot all these images, and these are just samples of them. We're giving them with um, BB-8, um, with, uh, with different poses and different parts of the image located either in front of the image with a lot of background or, you know, at the large part of image with less background. Um, you have your R2-D2 with a car at the back. So you can see there are different poses, different color patterns within the image. And also the characters with different um, other characters in there. Let's go down here. And so all of this, the model is going to have to take it, analyze it, and use it and be able to distinguish, this is the classification problem, between BB-8 and R2-D2. So let's see. So Data Robot is done reading our data. Um, and now here you can see the same images I've sh shown you before um, displayed right here. Um, you can also see that, you know, you have this variable that you're going to predict and then you're basically trying to distinguish between R2D2 and BB8. So let's make that our target variable. And then we just press that and ask Data Robot to build us those models. So while Data Robot is doing that, I'm just going to go ahead and go to a project that I've already built. So I can show you some of the things that you can see once that project is done. So first, when Data Robot is done building all your models, Data Robot puts them at our leaderboard where you see all these different models that Data Robot built for you, and you can pick one of them and explore it some more. What I want to show you today is um, a really nice, um, two really important features that we have with Visual AI, and that is our image embedding. And essentially, let me enlarge this. What you see with our image embedding is that Data Robot now displays um, the, the, the images that it worked on, a sample of them. And you can see what Data Robot considers, or this particular model here, considers to be similar images. So one nice thing that you can see with this image is that the um, R2D2s are concentrated towards the left of this display. And then the BB-8s tend to be con concentrated towards the right of this display. This is good. Because now you know that Data Robot has found um, content within these images that helped it to figure out what constitutes a BB-8, what features of this image make a BB, sorry, make an R2D2. And on the other side, the specific features in the image of a BB-8 that Data Robot um, identified and is using them to discriminate those. Obviously, there are also sometimes um, some R2D2s, like I've showed before, that um, like this one that seems to have features that look like a BB-8, and therefore it's here. Um, and also now in the middle here, you see a combination of R2D2s and BB-8s as well. So this is a good sign that our model is able to learn the difference between these two characters as far as the images are concerned. Um, also, well, a very nice thing you can do with data robot and images is that you can also look at what does the model use to distinguish these two characters. So one thing you can notice here, if you see this back, black background, that means the model is ignoring these areas of the image. But the, the areas that are lit up, that's the area that the model is concentrating on. And one good thing that you can see in every single image in here is that the model is actually focusing on things that you and I would focus on if we were to do, if we were to en embark on a, on a project where we want to use images to distinguish between BB-8 and R2-D2. So we actually, we would look at the robots themselves in the image and definitely ignore the background. And that's exactly what the model is doing. So this is a good sign that our model is doing something very sensible and we could probably, you know, trust it. 
So um, you've seen me sort of, you know, use this data, enter it in data robot, press the, you know, find the target and press the start button. So we have sent you um, the data you can see it in your email and we would like for you to try this um, within data robot so that you can get a, a taste for how you can build your own models within data robot and get the results the way that i've shown you thank you so much i hope this was very informative for you All right. Hey, thanks, Data Robot team. That was um, that was fantastic. And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can beat um, the uh, the algorithm when it comes to differentiating characters. I'm, I already know how I'll be uh, be using uh, my free trial soon. So for everybody who wants to set up that free trial, we'll have information um, pop up on that in uh, in just a second. For now, you guys have been asking some amazing questions, and uh, and so if we can get the the whole team back on screen here. So, uh, so we'll, we'll do a, a Q&A session um, and, and, um, and answer some of these. I think um, one of the most common questions we've been getting is um, just about, uh, you know, how, how do we get involved in machine learning and, and artificial intelligence? And so um, they'd be interesting, just kind of go around and sort of a two part question. And it was kind of go in the order that, that you guys presented. Um, how did you get involved in, in working in AI? And, you know, what's one piece of advice you have for kids who would like a, a career in AI, um, what th what should they be doing now in uh, in junior high or high school? So, um, Sarah, you went first to uh, to start. You want to go first again? Sure, uh, we can just go around. Um, I don't think I knew I wanted to get into AI right away. I studied physics, um, but I knew that I liked math decently well, and AI seemed to be something that was touching everything, right? And so in terms of developing a, a skill set that you can use to do literally anything, that's what AI is right now. Um, so in terms of advice, I, I guess I'd say, you know, it, it does, does require some math and coding. Um, so that's something that you've got to lean into, but it may not, even if it's not natural to you right away, it may be something that you find out comes to you with passion. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and I like that the common thread I think we may see in some of these, and we, we did this um, class a couple of weeks ago, is not everybody knew they wanted to get into AI, but then once they learned more about it, they found that it was, you know, an exciting way to solve other problems. Um, Natalie, I think um, you, know, you had a great answer for it. And we did this a couple of weeks ago. Um, so how did you get involved and, and what's your advice to, to kids today who are, uh, are thinking about getting involved themselves? Sure. So like Sarah, I didn't know that I, I wanted to get involved in AI when I, I first started. Um, my master's degree is actually in public administration, but there's a really cool intersection of um, how do we uh, uh, have our government, you know, use the, the um, most recent technologies and the newest technology. And I had the opportunity, uh, I, I used to work for IBM before I joined uh, Data Robot. And what we were doing there was some really cool stuff, like predicting when the mail was going to be delivered on time, right? Um, predicting uh, what other services would be, you know, for uh, uh, different government organizations. And I thought, you know, this is really cool, and I'd I'd like to get involved more. And that's what led me to Data Robot. My advice to students would be. Um, just look and, and think about where AI could be around you. Like, for example, when your phone unlocks when it sees your picture, that's AI. Um, we talked about classification algorithms. It's actually classifying, is this a picture of Natalie or not when it unlocks it? Um, so it, it's really all around you. And just think about where you see it and the areas that you'd like to get involved in it. Awesome, great advice. I, I I've noticed actually my uh, my phone when it sees pictures of BB-8 starts to unlock. So uh, so maybe maybe it's struggling a little bit. Maybe Rosalia could could teach him a thing or two. Um, same question to you, Rosalia. Yeah. Um. So I I got interested in it. I actually I didn't even know it was called AI back then. It was really, I was just, I was doing biochemistry and um, I was interested in predicting protein structure. Then I did a course in computer programming and I love programming. And so when I'm putting those two together, it almost seemed, you know, it at the time it seemed like a good idea to learn to do um, 
pro predicting protein structures programmatically so using all the different tools that were available then. And that's basically how I got into AI. Then I decided to do, you know, to continue pursuing uh, computer science uh, because I was already doing a lot of programming, a lot of computer science classes in college. Um, so that's really how I got into AI, just through experimenting with classes. And also because I went into a liberal arts college where that was encouraged and I took my first pro computer programming class. Then I connected that with my biochemistry and, and here we are, uh, the PhD in computer science. Um, my advice though to everybody is try different fields while you have the opportunity, you know, in, in, in college, you know, don't be shy. I mean, you can go into college thinking that, you know, you want to do one field, but if the opportunity arises to try something else, I'd say, you know, try it and see, you know, you may find that AI, you know, and AI comes in different, you know, there are different parts to AI. So, you know, try different aspects of it and see what you think about it. You may like it. Awesome. That's that's really good advice. A um, couple of themes I, I saw in there that I really liked. One is um, take the class. You're not even sure if you're going to like when you have an opportunity for an elective that, you know, sometimes it's the class you, you know, just sort of took on a whim that teaches you something that you use in the future. And then the other thing I've loved in uh, talking to really everybody at, at Data Robot, um, so we'll have another group come in on Friday and we'll probably ask them the same question because I know, I know students love hearing that one, is so many people got into... AI because they saw problems they wanted to solve, whether in you know biology or, or public policy or any of those kind of things. And I think that's um, that's fascinating, right? It's, it's a tool to be able to solve all kinds of problems, which leads to one of my favorite questions. Um, it's really neat seeing when when you know kids start chatting in, everybody's seeing the potential on how to use it to make a better world. Um, so I don't know who's best to, to answer this one, but um, do you at Data Robot talk to, and they mentioned doctors in particular, or sort of, you know, doctors or other folks like that to learn what kinds of problems they're trying to solve and, and how to use AI to best help them? Um, I think I can take that question. Um, I'm on a team with Natalie and Rosalia that at Data Robot we called AI for Good. Um, and so for free, we work with programs that are using AI for good to improve people's lives for the better. And one of the programs we're working with is a brain and spinal injury institute um, out of San Francisco and they're in the general hospital over there. And so right now we're working with them to, with AI to improve treatment for patients that have really bad spinal cord injuries. And so, you know, that's just one start, you know, that's what something we're working on. Um, but, you know, it doesn't take long to find that um, lots of people in science are beginning to use AI to find patterns that wouldn't be obvious otherwise. I love that answer. Well, thank you for, uh, for what you're doing. Yeah, if, if you want to hear more about AI for good and uh, the way that Data Robot is using it, uh, please come back Friday. There's some some really cool demonstrations um, for what's going on. And, uh, and I kind of like, you know, what you mentioned. It's sort of, you know, it's a way to process data, find patterns and learn quickly. I, I love that term machine learning because it's just, you know, machines can learn a little bit faster than we can, particularly when we program in the right way. So, um, so I love that. Hey, um, another question. Uh, let me, let me, while I've got you, Sarah, um, one, another one of my favorites was, uh, you know, we, we heard about deep blue and the evolution since then. And that was, you know, what, 20 some years ago. Why do we sometimes beat the computer when we play the computer in chess? If, you know, now it's 2020 and it was beating our, 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 our best champions back in the nineties. You know, uh, the computer only plays as hard as it wants to, is kind of the unfair answer, right? We, we've shown that um, an AI that was trained to do a specific problem really, really well, tried it over and over and over again, more times than we could play a game in our lifetime, right? That can beat us, but the AI can also be, you know, told to play a little softer on us. And so that's one of the reasons why uh, chess with a computer is so much fun, because you start off on easy, right? And then you slowly graduate your difficulty and keep pushing that bar up against it. That's perfect. I, I, we, AI does what we train it to do. And so if we tell it, you know, let, let, let us win, it'd be a pretty terrible game if we just got clobbered in 10 moves every time. So, um, so yeah, it's uh, when we train it to 
keep people's attention, then uh, keeps people's attention. So uh, that's great. Hey, another question I've been fascinated by, so I was glad to see it, you know, a handful of, uh, of kids um, ask this one as well, is um, how do you compare the way that computers process data to the way our brains process data, if anyone has a good answer for that? And, you know, right now, which one do you think is, is more effective, um, our best computers or our best human brains, including some of those at Data Robot? So does anybody have good answers for that? So uh, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, they're not as different as you might think. So when you're doing something like um, uh, computer vision, the way that the computer sees an image is through different layers. So the computer is going to apply what's called different filtering layers to the image. And if you think about it, when you are looking at an image, you're also focusing on different things. And we sort of inherently know what to look at. The computer doesn't necessarily know, so it needs to apply all these different filters, which will highlight different parts of the image. And that's how it learns. Now, when it comes to um, comparing you know, how they perform, there's some things that um, computers do really well. Like if we're training them to do a specific example over and over again, they can be better than people. But when it comes to reading in a vast amount of information, um, we actually do a lot better. Like if you think about deciding when it's safe to cross the road, right? We need to look at how quickly the cars are moving, how many cars are on the road, all that stuff. That's really hard for a computer to do because again, we inherently know what's safe and what's not. A computer doesn't. Like a computer would need to track the cars and figure out what's the velocity of the car and what's the time the car would you know, impact you and do all these calculations. We don't think like that. We just know it's safe. So um, yeah, when it comes to you know, lots of information, we, we just do a lot better than computers. I like that. I'm, I'm sighing some relief. Uh, there's, there's still use for our brains, at least for another couple of generations. So um, thank you. That's, that's really good to hear. Um, hey, another really, really common question, I think kind of a fun one, is the company name is Data Robot. Um, so one is, uh, you know, is does Data Robot build robots? And if so, have, uh, have any of you personally built a robot? Um, I can answer that, and then maybe um, Natalie or Sarah can add to it. But I would say they are, well, a robot, you know, it's something that needs to be defined, you know, what is a robot, right? So I think data robot builds the the components that can be used to create a robot, right? Predictive models are pieces of a robot, right? If you have um, a self-driving car, it probably has a multiple models, you know, from classification to maybe regression and anomaly and whatever you put together, making up this thing that's driving by itself. So data robot will, will you know, takes part in building a, a robot. And maybe you could argue by that, you know, we're building a robot. Um, yeah, that would be my answer. <laughs> Somebody fill in. <laughs> I have not built a robot, <laughs> personally. We should add the word yet to that, right? Not yet. It, you know, you're still young, so there's opportunities. So, Sarah, I saw you chiming in. I, I certainly played around with some robotics in school. It was definitely part of it. Uh, data robot, despite the name, we don't build robots. Definitely been asked that professionally before as well. <laughs> well, with the name bot, you know, like bots have their, their place in computer. It doesn't have to be a physical being to, uh, to have, you know, elements of, uh, you know, a brain and all that. So I'll give you guys a pass on that. I think the name still counts because, um, yeah, it has elements of, of, you know, what a brain is. I, I think it kind of counts, even if it doesn't look like R2D2 or, or BB8. So, um, nice. um, Let's look at it. So one re really big, I think I love this question too, is, you know, the whole idea is based on, you know, Natalie, you showed the, uh, you know, the, the um, data points with, with home values and, uh, and square footage. And we've talked a little bit about self-driving cars and, and how they see the world and, and all those kind of things. Um, kind of a common theme of questions is where do computers get all of this data? How do they store it? Um, since you know we we know we're in the era of big data, but uh, how do computers get it, and how do they store it? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, so that's a great question. 
if you think about, so let's use the example of Facebook. So Facebook is, uh, this is gonna sound a little bit scary, but it's logging everything you do. So every post you click on, it's logging. Um, every image you look at, it's, it's calculating how long you look at it. Um, and it's storing all the interactions you do in a massive database. The same thing for Instagram. It's recording the posts you look at. It's recording how long you look at them. It's recording, you know, the number of messages you send a day. Like, honestly, everything you do on the platform, it's recording. Um, and they store these in something uh, uh, that's called a data lake, which will bring in a whole bunch of information from a variety of different sources. Um, and we used to store things in uh, a tabular format called a SQL table, and we've sort of moved beyond that into something called uh, NoSQL, <laughs> which means it will hold tabular information, it will hold images, it will hold audio, all kinds of stuff. Um, so the answer is, you know, when where do they get the information? A lot of times they get the information from us, right? They get the information from what we're doing and they're recording it. Good answer. Yeah. If anybody wants, uh, you know, kind of a, a personal horror story, go into location services in your phone. And uh, when you realize it knows where you go, where you spend time that AI, I think, right, predicts, you know, this is what we think is your home. This is where we think you work or go to school or any of those. I guess maybe it's not as terrifying in 2020 for uh, for those of us who haven't been going as many places. But um, it's, uh, you know, it's definitely using AI to, to that data that, that we give it or, um, you know, that it tracks us. So, um, Great answer. All right, the, the really fun one. Um, and so maybe we'll go um, reverse order of, of presentations because we've been going top to bottom. Um, so we may end toward this one before we get to the uh, the selfie and chance to win. So before we do that, I'm gonna remind everyone, have a camera nearby. We have an opportunity for you to take a, a selfie with the experts. If you post it to Instagram, which as, as Natalie uh, told us, will be tracked um, for, uh, for Mark Zuckerberg's convenience. Uh, but if you do post it to Instagram, tag Data Robot and tag Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win some really cool data, data robot swag. Um, we've got t-shirts and, uh, you know, and stuffed dolls and all those kind of things. So um, get those cameras ready. Um, but I want to ask, I think the, the most common question we get um, throughout all of these and, and my favorite one. Um, so starting with Rosalia, what are you most excited about uh, with AI, you know, a problem it's able to solve or a way it's enabled to enhance our, enhance our lives? What are you most excited about with AI in the future? Yeah, um, so I'm going to say the same answer as I said last time, we, you know, the, the probability that we can understand how our brains work. Um, I'm really excited about this because it, it has been a field that, you know, has been around for, I guess, a long, long time and people have been trying to figure it out and it's getting easier now. Um, and I guess, you know, as Sarah said, you know, it's a question of where will the computer figure out how we how the brain works or are we going to teach the computer how the brain works you know which comes first right but i'm very excited that there's so much progress right now in the field of ai that um the idea of trying to understand you know the brain function is now becoming more of a reality so i'm just excited about that Excellent. It shows. I'm, I'm excited about that too. So thank you. Um, Natalie, same question to you. What are you most excited about that, uh, that AI can help us do in the future? So like Rosalia, I will give the same answer I did before. I am most excited about quantum computers. So um, quantum computers will probably be the next major breakthrough when it comes to computing. And um, if we thought the computers that we have now are powerful, these quantum computers are going to be an order of magnitude more powerful and the amount of things we can do with you know uh, machine learning on these more powerful computers is going to make things so much easier it's going to make self-driving cars so much easier computer visions uh, training these models it, it, all of it will be uh, much faster with these new computers so that's what i'm most excited for excellent all right and sarah same question to you um, I think I have a little bit of a smaller answer. I am excited to see where, with this moment where AI is going really, really fast and expanding into so many things that touch our daily lives. I'm excited about all the possible ways, you know, small and big, that AI is going to keep making our lives better. All the kind of annoying things it can automate, all the decisions it can help assist, you know, when you sum them all up, 
I think I, I feel pretty profoundly that things are going to look better and better for us. Excellent. And I love that answer too, because right, like, you know, we, we mentioned it before, it's kind of how everyone got into AI. It's, uh, it's there to help us solve problems or, we, you know, program, we, we teach it the questions to, uh, to ask, and then it figures out the best answers to help us. So um, thank you. I love all of that. Now, okay, let me get to all of us on screen here. The other reason I like um, having that question up is uh, as it gets us smiling, thinking about the, uh, you know, the, the best exciting things that AI will, uh, will be able to help us do. And that's what we want heading into uh, to selfie with the experts. So um, if you guys, I'll duck off. I'm not an expert, but um, if everybody wants to, uh, to lean into the screen, take that picture again, once you get it on Instagram, um, tag Varsity Tutors and Data Robot, you'll be entered to win. So um, selfie with the experts time. All right, I was I was gonna say something like uh, you know you should have should have you know made a robot pose, but I don't really know what that is. So uh, so everybody did really well. Uh, we'll keep smiling in case anybody missed it, and you know if you get me in there. I guess that's not terrible. Um, hey, a huge thank you to uh, to everyone at Data Robot. Um, does anybody here want to preview why? Um, I mean. The answer is really why not, but uh, why should we come back on Friday for lesson two? Not all at once. I'll, I, I can say it. I, I've seen lesson two um, and it's great. The um, kind of the altruism of, you know, how can AI help? Data Robot has some amazing partners and, and groups that they're working with to um, to make the world a better place. So um, it's uh, if you if you like today, I think there's even more practical value on, on how AI will uh, will make the, the world a better place is already making the world a better place. So um, anyone with anything to add before we take off? Awesome. All right. Well, huge thanks again, Rosalia, Natalie, Sarah. Huge thanks to everyone here who asked questions. Um, if we didn't get to your question, don't worry about it. We'll uh, we'll have Friday to uh, to be able to get to that as well. So um, we'll uh, we'll wrap up for today, but be thrilled to uh, to see everyone back here on Friday. On the way out, um, here is the information for how you can take advantage of your data robot free trial. So um, thanks everybody, sign up, use that free trial. Um, I'm committing to, uh, to using mine and uh, we'll see everybody back on Friday.